Hello everybody, welcome to this CHI 2020 paper presentation. I am Roland Eigner and together with my co-authors Andreas Pointner and Thomas Breindl, I performed a study on embroidered resistive pressure sensors. So the objective here is to manufacture force sensitive resistors, or FSRs for short, on a textile basis using an embroidery machine and to get a better understanding about their characteristics and performance. Just as a quick introduction, to those who are not familiar, FSRs are electrical elements that change resistance whenever stress is applied, which then can be measured quite easily. They date back to a patent by Franklin Evendorf from 1979, and they are quite widespread. They are not particularly precise, but they feature several advantages. They are easy to fabricate, inherently low cost, durable, and very easy to use with basic driver electronics. For instance, you can use a simple voltage divider which you hook into your ADC of your Arduino and you're good to go. In a common implementation, they consist of sandwiched foils with resistive polymer film in combination with interdigitated conductive grids, which are screen print on top. Now when the electrodes are pressed into the polymer sheet, that gives you a variable resistance depending on pressure. We replicate this on textile accordingly by using a conductive yarn and a textile-based resistive sheet. These two electrode yarns are then connected to measurement electronics, which perform the readout and the processing. Here you can see the basic design of our sensor. We have a packing material where the sensor is applied upon. We have a carbon-based semiconductive material for the resistive sheet. And we have two electrodes made from conductive yarn, which is looped with a bobbin thread on the backside. In our case, the resistive material is a Carbotex from Swiss company Sephor. It's a weave of PA monofilaments, which are covered with layers of carbon particles. And you can get them in different mesh counts. There are also other options for the resistive material. A very widespread one is the Onyx, which then is not a weave, but a knit, meaning it's stretchable. But we noticed its behavior is kind of inconsistent, so we decided to go with the Carbotex. In terms of conductive thread, we evaluated a high number of, con of candidate yarns. Uh, you can find details on the supplementary material along our paper, and in the end we decided to use the Madeira HC40. Note, by the way, that the electrodes do not necessarily have to be on top of the resistive sheet. One or even both of them may also be below, meaning you can create electro traces with intersections, which is quite useful, as you will see later. Now, it is often stated that the change of resistance in an FSR is due to the compression of particles in the piezo-resistive material when pressure is applied. However, according to the ICMI paper of Weiss and Wurm, most contributing to the functionality seems to be a so-called interface effect. They state that the polymer surface which is kind of rough on a microscopic level, is in little contact with the electrodes at rest. And when, whenever pressure is applied, the surfaces are compressed together. This increases the contact area quite dramatically and in turn decreases the electrical resistance. This is also in line with our observations of how our textile sensors work, namely that the yarn is in loose contact at rest. And when the yarn is pressed closely to the resistive sheet, the resistance decreases significantly. Now there are several design parameters influencing the characteristics of our textile sensor and the question is can we estimate them beforehand what value ranges will we get and what are the actual correlations to physics and do they even hold for the rather imprecise nature of textile manufacturing? Well it turns out that yes they do but let's first have a look at what our parameters are in the first place. We know that the resistance of an electrical conductor depends on its cross-section area, its length, and on a resistivity constant that depends on the actual material. So this is quite intuitive. Translating this to our textile sensor, we can see that the contact area A is basically the traces of our conductive yarn, which we approximate with electrode length L times sheet thickness T, while D is simply the distance between the electrodes. Here we see this mapped on our sensor patch. Now we can go on and tell that the material thickness is also constant, right? We can postulate we use the same material for all of our sensors, 
Hence, we can summarize material resistivity and thickness to a single constant, Rs, which is commonly termed the sheet resistance. Now, in our evaluation, it turns out that yes, when we vary electrode distance d, the resistance of the resulting sensor patch scales directly proportional. It's even strikingly linear. On the other hand, when we vary electrode length, this is also in line with theory, we can see that the sensor resistance is inversely proportional, just as the formula suggests. Uh, so this means we can, to some degree, calculate on this basis on approximate what the resistance of a sensor will be beforehand. And therefore, we can design it with the capabilities of our hardware in mind. Furthermore, we identified several additional parameters uh, that are also highly influential to the sensor characteristics Mostly they are related to the interface effect I mentioned earlier. For example, what we call double stitches, which is when you embroil it both ways along a single track, there and back. This is necessary for some of our pattern designs, as you will see later, and expectedly it has a huge impact on the amount of contact between yarn and resistive sheet. Also mostly related to the interface effect, there are several more parameters. Uh, such as stitch length, electrode layering, and intersections, which we also evaluated. I'll skip over them here due to the time limit, so please refer to the paper for more details. Instead, since our work is also about uh, space filling parents, let's dive into our motivation for that. Initially, we are coming from this angle of fairly dense and high-resolution sensing matrices that you get when you combine grids like in Chang's work, depicted here on the left. However, this isn't, always, this isn't always required or possible. Grau presents a work dealing with mechanical force redistribution for high accuracy interpolation between sensor cells. However, this requires a rigid setup and is definitely not applicable for, text, uh, for textiles. Furthermore, we don't want to be stuck to square sensor cells. We would like to combine uh, also different cell sizes. Suppose you have a layout like this here. Uh, with a rather traditional approach, you would get something like this. But this doesn't scale so well. Uh, what, is, what if this is at a size of, say, 10 by 10 centimeters, and you want to sense finger touch? There are dead spots all over the place where you're not able to sense anything. So what you, so what you can do to compensate is obviously to increase resolution. But this means the minimum size of your actuator dictates the number of your electrodes, and that's unfavorable. Since it also increases complexity in electronics and processing, it increases the amount of data, it's, it probably decreases your achievable sample rate, and maybe you're not even interested in this additional data. Then it also causes unnecessary computational load for data processing or downsampling. And maybe you're limited because you're running on an embedded system, you get the idea. For that reason, we propose to use space filling patterns instead. So you use the same number of electrodes, but you guide them in a sort of winding manner. Uh, this way, they cover most of the space, and you get a somewhat uniform responsiveness all over the sensor area. And in the textile field, this takes us to embroidery. Because embroidery machines are specifically designed and tuned for stitching arbitrary shapes and sizes. Also, the workflow of designing or even automatically generating shapes and patterns on PC and then sending them to the machine is quite useful for rapid prototyping. There you see an example of a resulting sensor, front side and back side. Note that the white bobbins red on the back side simply holds the electrode stitches in place, but that's regular yarn, so only the electrode traces on top are actual conductive yarn. You can also fabricate them in number of scales due to the fractal property of this particular pattern here without having to sacrifice resolution and without causing any dead spots. It also gives you control about several design options. You can link multiple patterns, you can combine different scales depending on your required granularity, however you like. Note that for the meander pattern, the electrodes have to be on different layers thus separated by resistive sheet. Uh, one electrode is below, one above, otherwise you would get, obviously, a short at the center, where one trace crosses the other. 
Some other patterns don't require these intersections. They're not always beneficial. Now let's see the actual space filling patterns that we compared. We chose them along several properties, such as intersection count and ratio of double and single stitches. First is the interdigitated electrode layout, or IDE for short, which is probably the most common for printed FSRs. It has no intersections, but lots of double stitches along the forks here. Second is the Bostrophedon, quite the opposite, with lots of intersections, but no double stitches whatsoever. The meander, already mentioned, uh, which we found in related literature in context of capacitive sensing. It has a single intersection in the center, which causes non-uniform response across the sensor area, meaning it is most sensitive in the center, which is, in fact, quite bad in some use cases. This kind of FAMAS spiral avoids this intersection by just stopping at the center, which means that when you want to link multiple of those, you have to stitch inwards to the center and then back out again. So you would actually double stitch 100% of your traces, which is probably a trade-off. Lastly, the Hilbert curve is an example of a space filling curve from mathematical analysis. So we decided to include one of those as well in our evaluation as they frequently show up. It shows no intersections. However, for linking multiple of those, you also have to double stitch most parts, just like with the Fermat spiral. Reason is there is a dead end for the upper electrode right here, and to guide the needle back out again, without introducing an intersection, you would have to stitch all the way back. Also, most candidates of those base filling curves, meaning Hilbert, Piano, Moore curves, and so on, are probably the worst in terms of scaling, since they, the sizes rise exponentially with curve order. For the others presented here, you are quite flexible, you can, for example, always add one more loop to the meander when you need it slightly bigger, but this doesn't work for the Hilbert. Of course, there are many, many more possible patterns, but this should provide a good coverage for lookup. So we expect any possible pattern will have a good equivalent within this set. In terms of characteristics, they all perform similar, however, in vastly different ranges. Just to pick the most outstanding one as an example, which is the Bostrophilon, with its many intersections, it has a very low resistance, um, starting at only 150 ohms at rest for the Order 2 implementation, in contrast to the Fermat with almost 10 times the resistance at the same size. This will probably have implications on the choice of your electronics. I want to close with some lessons learned in terms of manufacturing, because this is highly important in practice. First of all, don't choose the stitch length too low. Not only would you reduce the dynamic range, but you may also destroy or severely harm the resistive sheet, uh, which could even rip in the worst case. Secondly, also consider the back side of your patches. Keep in mind that the bobbin thread may pull conductive yarn out of place, causing shorts between the two electrodes. Ideally, you already design your patterns with that in mind. Lastly, whenever the machine trims the conductive yarn, you unfortunately have to double check. There's always some residue yarn that you have to trim manually, meaning with scissors. Tiny frails, hardly recognizable with bare eye, will cause shorts and render your sensor defective. So this was it. Thanks for watching. And if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email or visit our website at mi-lab.org.